After some time, when Krishna and Balaram had grown a little, they began to play more with their friends. One day the boys joined Balaram and told Mother Yasoda that Krishna had eaten clay. On hearing this, Mother Yasoda caught hold of Krishna's hand and asked, Krishna, why have you eaten dirt? All your friends, including Balaram, are complaining about you. My dear mother, all these boys, including my elder brother Balaram, are speaking lies against me. I have never eaten clay. While playing with me, Balaram became angry and has joined with the other boys to complain. If you don't believe me, then just look within my mouth to see whether I have taken clay or not. The Supreme Lord Sri Krishna then opened his mouth just like an ordinary boy. And when Mother Yasoda looked within, she saw the complete cosmic creation, including the entire outer space in all directions. She saw mountains, islands, oceans, seas, planets, air and fire, moon and stars, along with the total ego and the products of the senses, like sound, smell, vision, touch and taste. She also perceived within his mouth all living entities, eternal time, material and spiritual nature, activity, consciousness and different forms of the whole creation. Mother Yasoda realized that within his mouth was everything necessary for the entire cosmic manifestation. And she also saw herself taking Krishna upon her lap and giving him her breast milk. Upon seeing all this, she became struck with awe and began to wonder. Am I dreaming? Or actually seeing something extraordinary? This is either a dream or an illusion. Perhaps I have become mad and mentally deranged to see all these wonderful, uncommon things. Perhaps my child has attained some mystic power, and therefore I am perplexed by such visions within his mouth. Let me offer my respectful obeisances unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, under whose illusory energy I am thinking that Nanda Maharaj is my husband and Krishna is my son, that all the properties of Nanda Maharaj belong to me and that all the coward men and women are my subjects. All this misconception is due to the illusory energy of the Lord. As Krishna grew up, he performed many wonderful pastimes, and the residents of Vrindavan, Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda, the cowherd men and the gopis, always remembered his activities and were constantly merged in an ocean of transcendental bliss. But many demons came even to Vrindavan to disrupt the peaceful atmosphere, and Krishna and Balaram were always ready to protect the inhabitants from any disturbances. In the meantime, Kangsa was always absorbed in enmity towards Krishna. He was living with the fear that Krishna would someday kill him. Finally, one day Kangsa was again visited by Narda Muni. Narda Muni's mission was to help finish things quickly. He wanted to expedite matters, so he approached Kangsa with the real information. My dear Kangsa, you are to be killed by the eighth son of Vasudev. That eighth son is Krishna. Vasudev misled you into believing that the eighth child was a daughter. What? Actually, the daughter was born of Nanda Maharaj and Yashoda. Krishna and his brother Balaram, who are living under their care, are really the sons of Vasudev. Being afraid of your cruel nature, Vasudev tactfully hid them in Vrindavan, out of your sight. The men you sent there to kill different children were all killed by Krishna and Balaram. I'll kill Vasudev for his duplicity. Why are you so anxious to kill him? Better try to kill Krishna and Balaram. So acting on the new information, Kangsa arrested Vasudev and his wife and shackled them in iron chains. He called for the Keshi demon and asked him to go to Vrindavan to kill Krishna and Balaram. In actuality, Kangsa asked Keshi to go to Vrindavan to be killed by them and thus get liberation. 
Then Kangsa called for the expert elephant trainers, Chanura, Mushtika, Shala, Toshala, and others. My dear friends, hear me. In Vrindavan, there are two brothers, Krishna and Balaram. They are actually the sons of Vasudev. As you know, I have been destined to be killed by Krishna. There is a prophecy to this effect. Now, prepare for a wrestling match. People from different parts of the country will come to see the festival. I will arrange to get those two boys here, and you will kill them in the wrestling arena. Also, the huge elephant Kuvalya Peter can be kept by the gate of the wrestling camp. He can crush these boys when they arrive. Now, to ensure the success of our plan, let us worship Lord Shiva by offering animals in sacrifice. Kangsa then called for Akrura, and when he arrived at his palace, Kangsa very politely shook hands with him. My dear Akrura, welcome, welcome. Actually, I've no better friend than you in the Boja and Yatu dynasties. You are the most munificent person. So as a friend, I am begging charity from you. My lord, I am prepared to do whatever you want. Good. I request you to leave for Vrindavan at once and bring back the two boys named Krishna and Balaram. They are sons of Nanda Maharaj. A chariot has been prepared for you. Go immediately and encourage the boys to come to see the beauty of Mathura and take pleasure in the wrestling competition. If I may ask, what do you really intend to do? <laughs> My plan is to kill these two boys. I'll have you know that after killing Krishna and Balaram, I plan to get rid of all my enemies, Vasudeva and Nanda, also my father, Ubrasena, and his brother, Devaka. They are all a hindrance to my schemes. Now my father-in-law, Jarasandha, and many other allies will help me destroy all the kings who support the demigods. So, this is my plan. Then I shall be free from all opposition, and it will be very pleasant to rule the entire world without obstruction. My dear king, your plans are very excellent, but you should maintain some discretion, or they will not be fruitful. After all, man proposes and God disposes. We may make some great plan with our fertile brain, but unless it is sanctioned by the supreme authority, it will fail. But I have nothing to say against your plan. As a friend, I shall carry out your order and bring Krishna and Balaram here as you desire. After instructing his friends in various ways, Kangsa retired and Akrura went to Vrindavan. In the meantime, the demon Keshi assumed the form of a terrible horse and made his way to Vrindavan. His great mane flew and his hooves dug up the earth. He began to whinny and terrify the residents of Vrindavan with his tail wheeling in the sky like a big cloud. Krishna could understand that the horse was challenging him to fight. The horse rushed towards Krishna, making a horrible sound like a roaring lion. Keshi tried to trample Krishna with his forceful legs. Suddenly, Krishna caught hold of his legs and thus baffled him. Krishna whirled him around and around and threw him a hundred yards just as easily as Garuda throws a big snake. The horse was so dizzy that he passed out. But when he regained consciousness, he rushed towards Krishna in great anger again with his mouth wide open. But as soon as he reached Krishna, the Lord pushed his left hand within the horse's mouth. The horse felt it to be like a red-hot iron rod. Immediately his teeth fell out. Krishna's hand began to inflate and Keshi's throat choked up. The great horse began to suffocate. 
Sweating profusely, he threw his legs hither and thither. As his last breath came, he passed stool and urine, and his eyeballs bulged from their sockets. Thus, his life expired. Krishna was not surprised that the Keshi demon was killed so easily. But the demigods were amazed, and out of great appreciation, they showered flowers upon him. The next morning, Akrura started for Vrindavan. Akrura was a great devotee of the Lord, and on his journey, he constantly thought of Krishna's lotus eyes. I am most fortunate. Today I will see Krishna, whom great mystic yogis desire to see. Even though they may meditate upon him for untold years, he remains hidden to them. Today my sins will be washed away and my life will be successful. To see Krishna, the Supreme Lord, face to face, he who is worshipped by Brahma, Narda, Shiva, by all the great sages and demigods. Akrura knew beyond a doubt that Lord Krishna is the Supreme Vishnu. Lord Vishnu glances over the material energy and thus the cosmic manifestation comes into being. And although Lord Vishnu is the creator of this material world, he is free from the influence of material energy and can pierce its darkness with his internal potency. By expansion of this potency, Lord Krishna created the inhabitants of Vrindavan. Akrura continued to meditate. As soon as I arrive in Vrindavan, I will get down from my chariot and fall before the Supreme Lord. I am going to see Krishna as a messenger of the enemy, but the Lord will surely know my heart. I will stand before him with all humility. Perhaps he will be pleased with me and smile lovingly upon me. Certainly Krishna and Balaram will call me, O Akrura, O Uncle, and then my whole life will be glorious. Akrura passed the whole journey without knowing how long it took. He reached Vrindavan by the end of the day, as the sun was setting. On the ground, he saw the footprints of the cows and of Lord Krishna, whose footprints were impressed with the mark of the flag, trident, thunderbolt, and lotus flower. Akrura immediately jumped down from the chariot. He became overwhelmed with joy. He wept, and his body trembled. Akrura fell to the ground and began to roll in the dust. When Akrura entered Vrindavan, he saw Krishna and Balaram milking the cows. Krishna was dressed in yellow garments and Balaram in bluish. Akrura also saw that Krishna's eyes were exactly like the beautifully grown lotus flower of the autumn season. He saw both Krishna and Balaram in the spring of their youth. Although both were similar in bodily features, Krishna was blackish in complexion, whereas Balaram was whitish. Both were the shelter of the goddess of fortune. They had well-constructed bodies and pleasing faces, and they were as strong as elephants. Now, Akrura saw them face to face. They glanced at him, smiling. Akrura, overwhelmed, fell flat before them. Lord Krishna, who was very kind to his devotees, raised Akrura and embraced him. Balaram also embraced Akrura. Taking him by the hand, Krishna and Balaram brought him to their sitting room, where they offered him a very nice seat. They offered him a cow in charity, and then brought a variety of edibles. After he had eaten, Akrura was given betel nut and spices to chew. At this time, Nanda Maharaj spoke up. My dear Akrura, what shall I inquire from you? Of course you are being protected by King Kansa, who is cruel and a maniac. His protection is just like the butcher who protects the animals that he will kill in the future. Kansa is so selfish that he has killed the sons of his own sister. So how can I honestly believe that he is protecting the citizens of Mathura? At the end of the evening, Krishna and Balaram bid Akrura good night. 
Krishna also asked about his uncle, Kangsa. How was he dealing with his friends? How are my relatives? It is a shame that Kangsa is the head of the kingdom. The citizens cannot expect any justice under his rule. And my father Vasudev has undergone much tribulation simply from my being his son. My good friend Okura, tell me, what is the purpose of your coming to Vrindavan? Kangsa has sent me. Narda Muni told him that you are residing here and that it was you who had killed so many of his demoniac friends. Kangsa then ordered me to bring you to Mathura under the plea of attending a wrestling match. But actually, he plans to kill you. After hearing of this information, Balaram and Krishna, who are very expert in killing opponents, mildly laughed at the plans of Kangsa. They asked Nanda Maharaj to invite all the cowherd boys to go to Mathura. Kangsa wanted them all to go there to participate in the function. On Krishna's word, Nanda Maharaj at once called for the cowherd boys and asked them to collect many kinds of milk preparations to present in the ceremony. Nanda Maharaj informed the cowherd boys that they would start the next morning. They therefore arranged for the cows and bulls to carry them to Mathura. When the gopis heard that Akrura had come to take Krishna and Balaram away to Mathura, they became overwhelmed with anxiety. Some of them became so aggrieved that their faces turned black. Hearing the news, others who were engaged in household duties stopped working as if they had forgotten everything. Others fainted due to separation from Krishna. Remembering his attractive smile and his talks with them, the gopis became overwhelmed with grief. They began to remember his mannerisms, how he moved about Brindavan, and how with joking words he attracted their hearts. Thinking of Krishna and of their imminent separation from him, the gopis assembled together with heavy hearts. Completely absorbed in thought of Krishna, tears fell from their eyes. Oh, Providence, you are so cruel. It appears that you do not know how to show mercy to others. You bring friends together, and suddenly you separate them. This is exactly like child's play that has no meaning. First you show us Krishna's beautiful, smiling features, and then you want to separate him from us. Oh, Providence, you are so cruel. But most astonishingly, you appear now as a Kura which means not cruel. In the beginning, we appreciated your craftsmanship in giving us eyes to see the beautiful face of Krishna. But now, you are taking away our eyes, for we will not see Krishna here again. Krishna, the son of Nanda Maharaj, is also very cruel. He does not like to keep friendships for very long, but must always have new friends. We gopis of Vrindavan have left our homes friends and relatives to become Krishna's maidservants. But he does not even look upon us. And now he is going to Mathura, where all the young girls are expecting his arrival. They will enjoy his sweet smiling face and will drink its honey. I fear that as soon as he sees the beautiful faces of the young girls in Mathura, he will become controlled by them and will forget us. My friend, do not expect Krishna to return to Vrindavan. Just see, without consideration, Krishna has already seated himself on the chariot. Is there no one to stop him from going? Even the demigods are unkind. Why don't they create some disturbance? Rainfall, a storm, or a hurricane? Without Krishna, we cannot live for even a moment. The gopis cried all that night. As soon as the sun rose, Akura got on the chariot with Krishna and Balaram. Nanda Maharaj and the cowherd men loaded the bullock carts with big earthen pots filled with yogurt, milk, and ghee, and they began to follow them. In spite of Krishna's asking them not to obstruct their way, all the gopis surrounded the chariot, looking at Krishna tearfully. Krishna was very much affected by seeing the plight of the gopis, but his duty was to start for Mathura. Krishna tried to console the gopis, 
But they would not disperse and simply looked on as the chariot drove away. They watched it as long as it was visible. Finally, they could only see the dust of the chariot in the distance. The gopis did not move at all, but remained standing still for some time as if they were painted pictures. The chariot proceeded towards the bank of the Yamuna River, and there Krishna and Balaram took their baths. They drank the crystal clear water of the Yamuna, and then took their seats again on the chariot, which was waiting beneath the shade of several large trees. Akrura then took their permission to also take bath. According to Vedic ritual, after taking bath in the river, one should stand half submerged in its waters and murmur the sacred Gayatri mantra. So while saying this prayer, Akrura suddenly saw both Balaram and Krishna within the water. How can this be? I left them sitting on the chariot. Confused, he immediately went back to the chariot. There they are, sitting exactly as I left them. This is indeed strange. He began to wonder about this, so Akrur went back to the river. There, he saw something very extraordinary. This time, he saw not only Krishna and Balaram, but many of the demigods and the denizens of heaven. He also saw the Sheshanaga, the divine serpent with thousands of hoods. Lord Sheshanaga was covered with bluish garments, and his necks were all white and appeared exactly like snow-capped mountains. On the curved lap of Sheshanaga, Akrura saw Krishna sitting very soberly with four hands. His eyes were like the reddish petals of the lotus flower. Balaram had turned into Sheshanaga, and Krishna had turned into Mahavishnu, who began to smile. The Supreme Lord was surrounded by intimate associates, like the four Kumaras, as well as Sunanda and Nanda, and demigods like Brahma and Lord Shiva. The nine great learned sages were there, and devotees like Prahlad and Narada were engaged in offering prayers to the Lord with clear hearts and pure words. Upon seeing this, Akrura became overwhelmed with great devotion and his body began to shiver in transcendental ecstasy. He bowed down. With folded hands and faltering voice, Akrura began to offer prayers to the Lord. O oh my Lord, I can now understand that everything within this universe emanates from your being. Fire is your mouth the earth, your feet, the sun, your eye, the sky, your navel, and the directions are your ears. Space is your head, the demigods are your arms, the oceans and seas are your abdomen, and the winds and the air are your strength and vitality. All the plants and herbs are the hair on your body, and the clouds are the hair on your head. The mountains are your bones and nails. The days and nights are the twinkling of your eyes. Prajapati, the progenitor, is your genitals. And the rain is your semina. You are the original source of all knowledge. Oh, my dear Lord, everyone within this world is identifying with a body and thus are transmigrating from one body to another. And I am no exception, for I am falsely thinking myself happy in possessing a home, wife, children, and property. Being bewildered by such misconceptions, I have forgotten you, the reservoir of all transcendental pleasure. I am just like a foolish creature who leaves the vast reservoir and goes in search of water in the desert. While Akur was offering his prayers to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Lord disappeared from the water, 
exactly as an expert dramatic actor changes his dress and assumes his original feature. Akrura came out of the water and returned to the chariot of Krishna and Balaram. Akrura was struck with wonder. Krishna asked, Akrura, have you seen something wonderful? My dear Lord, all wonderful things that are happening within this world, either in the sky, or in the water, or on the land, appear in your transcendental form. My dear Lord, there cannot be anything more wonderful than your transcendental form. So when I have seen you, what is there left to see? Indeed, what wonderful things have I not seen? They took up their journey, and by the end of the day, they reached the precincts of Mathura. All passers-by along the way who saw Krishna and Balaram could not help but look at them again and again. In the meantime, the other inhabitants of Vrindavan, headed by Nanda and Upananda, had already reached Mathura by going through forests and rivers, and they were awaiting the arrival of Krishna and Balaram. Upon reaching the entrance to Mathura, Krishna and Balaram got down from the chariot and shook hands with Akrura. Krishna told him, You may go home now, because we shall enter Mathura along with our friends. My dear Lord, I am your surrendered servant. Please, you and your brother and your cowherd friends shall all come to my home and sanctify my house with the dust of your lotus feet. Akrura, surely Balaram and I will come to your home, but only after killing all the demons who are envious of the Yadu dynasty. Akrura then entered the city to inform Kangsa about the arrival of Krishna. In the meantime, Lord Krishna, Balaram, and the cowherd boys entered Mathura for a little sightseeing. The gate of Mathura was made of exquisite marble and was very well constructed. The doors were made of pure gold, and the whole city was encircled by cannons so that no enemy could enter very easily. All the road crossings were decorated with gold, and there were many rich men's houses, all appearing with costly jewels. Pigeons and peacocks cooed upon the balconies, and lamps of different sizes burned over the doorways. News spread that Krishna and Balaram had arrived. The residents gathered to see them, and the ladies went up to their roofs for a better view. They awaited the arrival of Krishna and Balaram with great anxiety, and in their extreme eagerness to see them, the ladies did not dress themselves properly. Some of them had been taking their lunch, and in great haste, left their meals and ran to the roof. Some of them were bathing, but without finishing their baths, hurriedly dressed themselves to see Krishna and Balaram. Some had put their dresses on wrong, some anointed their eyes on one side only, and some wore only one ankle bell or one earring. Passing by on the street very slowly like an elephant, Lord Krishna smiled to them, and his smiling stole their hearts. They had all heard about the uncommon qualities of Krishna and Balaram. Now, when they actually saw them, they took Krishna and Balaram within their hearts and began to embrace them to their fullest desire. Their hair stood up in ecstasy. From the rooftops, the ladies began to shower flowers upon Krishna and Balaram. All the brahmanas also went out with sandalwood and flowers and respectfully welcomed them to the city. The residents of Mathura began to talk among themselves about the elevated and pious activities of the people of Vrindavan, who were fortunate beyond measure to see Krishna and Balaram daily as cowherd boys. As Krishna and Balaram continued along the way, they saw a washerman and dyer of clothing. Krishna asked him, O oh, washerman, I wish to ask a favor of you. Well, be quick about it. I'm busy preparing this fresh cloth for the king. Why don't you give your nicest cloth to us? 
What, are you a beggar in need of clothing? No, I'm not in need of anything. But if you grant my request, then you will become very happy, and all good fortune will be yours. I am a servant of Kungsa. Is this some crude joke that you are asking for cloth which is meant for the king? My dear boys, don't be so impudent. Otherwise, his troops will arrest you and punish you. Then you'll be in real trouble. Surely you are strangers here, or else you'd know better. But I am a close servant of the king, and I have practical experience of this fact. <laughs> yes, indeed. From now on, you better watch what you say, or you'll be in real trouble. On hearing this, Lord Krishna became very angry at the washerman. Krishna struck him with the upper portion of his hand and cut off the man's head. The man's lifeless body fell to the ground. Seeing this ghastly act, the washerman's helpers trembled. Look what this boy has done! Without a sword, but simply with his hand, he cut off the head of our master. Thus they ran away in fear, leaving behind all the cloth. Krishna and Balaram took the choicest cloth and offered the rest to the cowherd boys. They then continued. In the meantime, a devotee tailor quickly prepared some clothes from that cloth for Krishna and Balaram. Thus being nicely attired, the brothers looked like elephants dressed in colorful clothing. Krishna then gave the tailor a benediction. My dear sir, I am very pleased by your service, and therefore I award you that after leaving this body, you will attain liberation and receive a body exactly like four-handed Lord Narayan in Vaikuntha. And throughout your present life, you will earn sufficient wealth to enjoy and live happily. Thus Krishna proved that his devotees will not be lacking in material enjoyment and after leaving this life, they will be allowed to enter the spiritual world for an eternal life of knowledge and happiness. Krishna and Balaram next went to a florist named Sudam. As soon as they reached his place, the florist immediately came out and with great devotion fell down to offer his respects. The florist very humbly and submissively offered prayers to the Lord. My dear Lord, because you have come to my place, I think that all my forefathers and my worshipable superiors are pleased and delivered. My dear Lord, you are the supreme cause of this cosmic manifestation. You are the friend of all living entities, and you are equally disposed to all. Indeed, you are the super soul, and you do not discriminate between friend and enemy. Yet, you are especially pleased by your devotee's love. My Lord, I am praying that you please tell me whatever you wish me to do, because I am your eternal servant. Please, allow me to do something for you. It will be a great favor to me. My dear Sudama, by this humble welcome of yours, you have already satisfied me very much. I beg you that I may remain as your eternal servant, and by such service I will surely benefit all living beings. Yes, my devotee is not selfish. Whatever benefit he may receive from me, he wants to give to all other persons. And that is the greatest of all humanitarian activities. After leaving the florist, Krishna and Balaram saw a hunchbacked young woman carrying a dish of sandalwood pulp through the streets. Since Krishna is the reservoir of all pleasure, he wanted to make his companions joyous by cutting a joke with the hunchbacked woman. O oh, tall young woman, who are you? Tell me. For whom are you carrying this sandalwood pulp in your hand? If you offer this sandalwood to me, surely you will be very fortunate. Oh dear beautiful dark boy, I am engaged as maidservant of Kangsa. I am supplying him pulp of sandalwood daily. The king is very pleased with me for my service, but I see that you two brothers are really the ones who should be served. 
being captivated by their beautiful features, the hunchback woman began to smear sandalwood pulp over the bodies of Krishna and Balaram with great satisfaction. Thus the two transcendental beggars, already very attractive, looked even more beautiful. Krishna was quite pleased by her service and thought of a suitable reward. He at once pressed down the feet of the hunchback woman with his toes and took her cheeks and gave her a jerk. Suddenly the hunchback woman straightened up and became very shapely and attractive, a most beautiful girl. Naturally, she felt very much obliged to Krishna and was so attracted by his beauty that without hesitation she caught hold of his garment. She smiled flirtingly and admitted that she was agitated by lusty desires. She forgot that she was on the street, standing amidst Balaram and his friends. My dear hero, I cannot leave you in this way. You must come to my place. I am already very much attracted to your beauty. I will receive you very well, for you are the best among men. You must be kind upon me and come to my home to fulfill my desires. Krishna, of course, felt a little bit embarrassed in front of his brother and all of their friends. Therefore, he simply smiled at her words. Looking towards the coward boyfriends, he replied to the girl, My dear beautiful girl, I am very much pleased by your invitation, and I will come to your home after finishing my business here. Such a beautiful girl like you is the only means of solace for a person like me, for I am away from home and not married. Certainly, as a suitable girlfriend, you can give us relief from all kinds of agitation. Krishna satisfied the girl with sweet words and proceeded down the street to the marketplace where the citizens were preparing to receive him with various kinds of presentations. The mercantile men in the market worshipped Krishna and Balaram with great respect. When Krishna was passing through the street, all the women in the surrounding houses came to see him, and some of the younger ones almost fainted, being captivated by his beauty. Their hair and tight dresses loosened, and they forgot where they were standing. Krishna next inquired from the citizens as to the location of the place of sacrifice. Kansa had arranged for the sacrifice called Dhanar Jagya, and to designate the area, he had placed a large bow near the sacrificial altar. The bow was very big and wonderful and resembled a rainbow in the sky. It was guarded by many of King Kansa's men, and as Krishna and Balaram approached the bow, the leader called out, What do you two want here? I'm warning you. Don't come any closer. The king has given orders that no one should touch the bow. Krishna ignored this warning. He forcibly went up and immediately took the big bow in his left hand. He strung the bow in the presence of the crowd and drawing it back, broke it in half. Everyone was amazed by this display of power. The sound of the bow cracking vibrated throughout the city and was also heard by Kansa. And at that moment, he became afraid for his very life. In the meantime, the caretaker of the bow became angry. Men, take up your weapons and arrest him. Kill him. Kill him at once. <laughs> The guards with uplifted weapons rushed at Krishna and Balaram and surrounded them. The brothers became angry and taking up two pieces of the broken bow, they began to beat off Kansa's men. While this turmoil was going on, Kansa sent out a small group of troops to assist the guards. But very quickly they were all killed off. After this, Krishna did not proceed further into the sacrificial arena, but went out the gate towards their own camp. Along the way, he visited various places in Mathura city with great delight. Seeing the activities and wonderful prowess of Krishna, all the citizens began to consider the two brothers to be demigods who had come down to Mathura, and they all looked upon them with great astonishment. 
The two brothers stroll through the streets, not caring for the law and order of Kansa. When evening came, Krishna and Balaram with their cowherd boyfriends went to the outskirts of the city where all their wagons were assembled. At the camp, Krishna was given a nice seat and offered milk and palatable foods. After taking supper and thinking of the next day's program, he very peacefully took rest. Thus, he passed the night there. From the day's events, Kangsu could understand that great danger was awaiting him the next day in the wrestling arena. This Krishna is no ordinary man. He has divine powers. The eighth son of Devaki has finally appeared, and now my death is imminent. Kangsa could not rest the entire night. He began to see various signs of death, both awake and dreaming. When he looked in the mirror, he could not see his head. And when he looked at the night sky, he saw the luminaries in double. He looked on the ground and saw holes in his shadow. And he could hear a high buzzing sound within his ears. All the trees before him appeared to be made of gold and he could not see his own footprints in dust. And after the night expired, he called for his ministers. I could not sleep. And during those moments when sleep did come, I had horrible dreams. Go on, my lord, tell us more. In a dream, I saw many kinds of ghosts crammed in a carriage drawn by asses I dreamed that someone gave me poison, and I actually drank it. I dreamed I was walking naked, only with a flower garland around my neck, and my body was smeared with oil. Surely my death is certain. Now listen, listen to me. Today, get our most ferocious elephant, Kuvalya Pita, and place him by the entrance of the wrestling arena. There he shall wait for the arrival of Krishna. The wrestling arena was prepared, cleansed and decorated with flags, festoons and flowers. The match was announced by the beating of kettle drums. Different types of galleries were arranged for respectable persons. Kings, Brahmanas, Chetriyas. The various kings had their own thrones, and the others had reserved seats. Kangsa finally arrived, accompanied by many ministers and guards. And although he was the great King Kangsa, sitting in the center of all the heads of state, his heart was palpitating in fear of cruel death. For when it comes, it does not care for anyone's exalted position. Everything was complete. Musicians played as the wrestlers entered the arena and exhibited their skills before the assembly. Some of the more famous wrestlers, Chanura, Mushtika, Shala, Kuta and Toshala, were agile and jolly. In the meantime, all the respectable cowherd men who came from Vrindavan, headed by Nanda, were welcomed by Kamsa. After presenting Kangsa with the milk products they had brought with them, the cowherd men also took their respective seats by the side of the king on a platform especially meant for them. After taking their baths and finishing their morning duties, Krishna and Balaram could hear the beating of the kettle drums in the wrestling camp. They got ready and went there to see the fun. As they reached the camp, they saw Kovalya Pita, a very large and dangerous elephant blocking the gateway. Krishna could understand why, and he prepared himself by tightening his dress before combating the elephant. He addressed the elephant's caretaker in a grave voice, as resounding as a cloud. You miscreant! Get out of my way and let me pass through the gate. My boy, you are in no position to be giving orders. If you block my way, I shall send you and your elephant to the house of death. You dare threaten me? My elephant will now put an end to your pride. Kovalya Pita, crush him! The elephant then moved before Krishna like inevitable death. It rushed towards him and tried to catch him with its trunk. But Krishna very skillfully moved behind the elephant. 
Being able to see only to the end of its nose, the elephant could not see Krishna hiding behind its legs and try to grab hold of him. Krishna again very quickly escaped capture. Running behind the elephant, Krishna caught its tail and pulled him some distance from the gate. Krishna pulled the elephant from this side to that, just as he used to pull the tail of a calf in his childhood. After this, Krishna went in front of the elephant and gave it a strong slap, and then slipped away from its view. Then, falling down on the ground in front of the elephant's legs, Krishna caused it to trip and fall. The elephant tried to pierce him with one of its huge ivory tusks. It roared in anger, and the elephant's caretaker, riding on its head, tried to provoke it further. And as the elephant rushed madly towards Krishna, the Lord caught hold of the trunk and pulled the elephant down. Krishna jumped up on the elephant's back and broke it and killed the caretaker also. After this, Krishna took an ivory tusk on his shoulder, decorated with drops of perspiration, and sprinkled with the elephant's blood, he felt very blissful and thus began to proceed towards the wrestling camp. Lord Balaram took the other tusk on his shoulder and accompanied by their cowherd boyfriends, they entered the arena. As he entered the arena, Krishna was perceived differently by different people according to their relationship with him, either favorable or unfavorable. He appeared to the wrestlers exactly like a thunderbolt, to the people in general as the most beautiful personality. To the women, he appeared to be the most attractive male, Cupid personified. The cowherd men looked upon Krishna as their own kinsmen, coming from the same village of Vrindavan. The Chetriya kings who were present saw him as the strongest ruler. To the parents of Krishna, Nanda and Yasoda, he appeared to be the most loving child. To Kangsa, who had already heard that the elephant had been killed, he appeared to be death personified. To the unintelligent, he appeared to be foolish and incapable, and to the yogis present, he appeared to be the super-soul. Thus appreciated differently by different kinds of men, Krishna entered the wrestling arena with Balaram and his coward boyfriends. When they saw the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna, the citizens of Mathura became very pleased, as if they were drinking the nectar of heaven. They began to talk among themselves about the two transcendental brothers. Just see the exquisite beauty of Krishna and Balaram. And they are dressed so magnificently, as if they were dramatic actors upon a stage. Surely they must be an expansion of Lord Narayan. Although Krishna was raised by Nanda Maharaj, he is actually the son of Vasudev. And all this time, while living in Vrindavan, Krishna struck down many demons who were sent there by Kansa to kill the children. Yes, yes, there was Putana the witch, as well as Tranavata, who came there as a whirlwind. There was Keshi, Denukasura, and many other demons who were killed by Krishna and Balaram in Vrindavan. Krishna also saved all the coward men of Vrindavan from a devastating forest fire. He chastised the Kaliya snake in the Jamuna river, and he curbed the false pride of the heavenly king Indra. Krishna held up the great Govardhan hill in one hand for seven continuous days, and he saved all the villagers from incessant rain, hurricane, and windstorm. At that time, musical instruments resounded, announcing the beginning of the wrestling match. In the arena, the famous wrestler Chanura then began to talk with Krishna and Balaram. My dear Krishna and Balaram, we have heard about your past activities. You are great heroes, <laughs> and therefore the king has called you. We have heard that your arms are very strong. Everyone here desires to see a display of your abilities. A citizen should be obedient and please the king, and thus you will attain his blessings. Otherwise, you will attain his wrath. You are coward boys, and we have heard that while tending your cows in the forest, you enjoy wrestling with each other. Therefore, we wish that you join with us in wrestling, so that all the people present here, along with the good king, will be pleased. <laughs> you are the subject of King Kamsa. 
and we are also indirectly, and we try to please him as far as possible. I have heard that wrestling is a great favorite of his, but the fact is that we are simply boys. We sometimes play at fighting in the forest of Vrindavan with our friends who are of equal age and strength, but to fight great wrestlers like you would not be good for the audience. It would contradict their religious principles. Krishna, we can understand that you are not an ordinary young man. You are transcendental to everyone, as is your elder brother, Balaram. Single-handedly, you have already killed the elephant, Kuvalia Pita, who in the past has defeated many other elephants. Now it is only proper that you compete with the stronger wrestlers among us. I, therefore, wish to wrestle with you, and your elder brother, Balaram, will wrestle with Mushtika. After Kamsa's wrestlers showed off their prowess, the Supreme Personality of Godhead Lord Krishna confronted Chanura and Lord Balaram confronted Mushtika. The combatants locked themselves together, each with a view to come out victorious. They joined palm to palm, head to head, chest to chest. They struck each other and pushed one another here and there and threw each other fiercely to the ground. Step by step the fighting increased. All the arts of wrestling were perfectly exhibited by the parties, as each tried his best to defeat his opponent. But the audience in the wrestling arena became very disturbed. Look, the combatants are not equally matched. Krishna and Balaram are mere boys compared to the huge wrestlers who are as solid as stone. There is great danger here. Even in front of the king, this wrestling is going on between incompatible sides. Mushtika and Chanura are as strong as great mountains, and Krishna and Bhagavan are two delicate boys of very tender age. The principle of justice has already left this assembly. Persons who are civilized will not remain to watch this unfair match, and those who do remain are not very enlightened. My dear friends, just look at the drops of perspiration on Krishna's face, which appears just like the lotus flower with drops of water. And do you see the face of Lord Balaram with its reddish hue? It is especially beautiful. See how he is engaged in a strong match with Mushtika. Ladies in the assembly also addressed one another. My dear friend, just imagine how fortunate the land of Vrindavan is, for the Supreme Personality of Godhead Himself is present, always decorated with flower garlands and engaged in tending cows along with his brother, Lord Balaram. He is always accompanied by his cowherd friends, and he plays his transcendental flute. The residents of Vrindavan are fortunate to be able to constantly see the lotus feet of Krishna and Balaram. I cannot estimate the pious activities of the gopis, the cowherd girls of Vrindavan, who are able to enjoy the Supreme Lord and look upon his unparalleled beauty. Krishna and Balaram are beyond compare, for they are the reservoir of all wealth, strength, beauty, fame, knowledge, and renunciation. The gopis are so fortunate that they can see and think of Krishna 24 hours a day, whether milking the cows or husking the paddy or churning butter in the morning. The gopis are always absorbed in thoughts of Krishna. When Lord Krishna understood that the ladies in the assembly were anxious for his safety, he decided not to continue wrestling, but to kill the wrestlers immediately. The parents of Krishna and Balaram, namely Nanda Maharaj, Yashoda, Vasudev and Devaki, were also very anxious because they did not know the unlimited strength of their children. Lord Krishna immediately struck Chanura thrice with his fist. To the astonishment of the audience, the great wrestler was jolted. Chanura then attacked Krishna just as one hawk swoops upon another. Folding his two hands, he began to strike the chest of Krishna. But Lord Krishna was not even slightly disturbed, no more than an elephant that is hit by a flower garland. Krishna quickly caught the two hands of Chanura and began to wheel him around and around and around. In this way, Chanura lost his life and Krishna threw him to the ground. Mushtika also struck Balaram, and Balaram returned the stroke with great force. Mushtika began to tremble, and blood and vomit flowed from his mouth. Thus he fell dead, just as a tree falls down in a hurricane. 
After these two wrestlers were killed, another wrestler named Kuta came forward. At once, Balaram caught hold of him and killed him nonchalantly. When the wrestler Shala entered the arena, Krishna immediately kicked him and cracked his head. Then Toshala was killed in the same way, and the remaining wrestlers fled in fear for their lives. All the cowherd boys cheered and approached Krishna and Balaram to congratulate them with great pleasure. The drums of victory resounded and the people clapped in great ecstasy. No one could estimate their happiness and the brahmanas began to praise the two brothers. Only Kangsa was morose. Stop the victory drums! I order that these two boys be driven out of Mathura at once. The coward boys who have come with them should be plundered and all their riches taken away. Kill Nanda Maharaj for his cunning behavior and the rascal Vasudev and also my father Ubrasena. Kill them all without delay. When Kangsa spoke in this way, Lord Krishna became very angry and within a second he jumped over the high guards of King Kangsa. Kangsa immediately drew his sword and prepared to answer the challenge of Krishna. As Kangsa wielded his sword up and down, Lord Krishna, the Supreme Powerful, caught hold of him with great force. Krishna knocked the crown from Kangsa's head, grabbed his long hair and dragged him from his seat to the wrestling dais and threw him down. Krishna at once straddled his chest and began to strike him again and again. Simply from the strokes of Krishna's fist, Kangsa lost his life. In order to assure his parents that Kangsa was dead, Lord Krishna dragged him just as a lion drags an elephant after killing it. On sight of this, a great uproar came from all sides as some spectators expressed their jubilation and others cried in lamentation. From the day Kamsa heard that he would be killed by the eighth son of Devaki, he was always thinking of Krishna while eating, walking or sitting, even while he was breathing. And naturally, Kamsa got the blessing of liberation. In the Bhagavad Gita, it is stated that a person gets his next life according to the thoughts in which he is always absorbed. Since Kangsa was thinking of Krishna, he was promoted to Vaikuntha Loka, what to speak of the pure devotees who are always absorbed in favorable thoughts of Krishna. Even an enemy who was killed by Krishna gets liberation and is placed in the impersonal Brahma Jyoti. Since the Supreme Personality of Godhead is all good, anyone thinking of him, either as enemy or as friend, gets liberation. Suddenly, Kangsa's eight younger brothers, headed by Kanka, combined together and all rushed towards Krishna to kill him. Kangsa and his brothers were Krishna's maternal uncles. Kangsa was very powerful and could not be killed by anyone else. Therefore, Krishna was obliged to kill him. As far as his eight brothers were concerned, Balaram took charge of them. He immediately took up an elephant's tusk and struck them down one after another, just as a lion kills a flock of deer. Krishna and Balaram thus confirmed the statement that the Supreme Personality of Godhead descends to give protection to the pious and to kill the impious demons who harass the saintly persons. The demigods from the higher planetary systems began to shower flowers, congratulating Krishna and Balaram. There was beating of drums and the wives of the demigods began to dance in ecstasy. The wives of Kamsa and his brothers, however, became aggrieved. They struck their foreheads and shed torrents of tears. They cried loudly and clutched the bodies of their husbands. Thus, the wives of the dead men began to lament. Our dear husbands, our protectors, now after your death, we are also dead, along with your homes and children. Oh, dear husbands, you treated persons ill who were faultless, and as a result, you have been killed. This is inevitable because a person who torments the innocent must be punished by the laws of nature. 
We know that Lord Krishna is the supreme master and supreme enjoyer of everything and therefore anyone who neglects his authority can never be happy and ultimately such a person meets death. Krishna was kind and affectionate to his grieving aunts. He gave them solace as far as possible. The funeral ceremony was then conducted under his personal supervision. After finishing this business, Krishna and Balaram approached their father and mother, Vasudeva and Devaki, who had been imprisoned by Kamsa. They fell at their parents' feet and offered them prayers. Vasudeva and Devaki had suffered so much because Krishna was their son. It was because of Krishna that Kamsa was always giving them trouble. Devaki and Vasudeva were fully conscious of Krishna's exalted position as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, although Krishna touched their feet and offered prayers to them, they did not embrace him, but simply stood up to receive them. When Lord Krishna saw that Vasudeva and Devaki were remaining in a reverential attitude, he immediately expanded his influence of Yoga Maya so that they could treat him and Balarama as children. Krishna very respectfully addressed them. My dear father and mother, Although you have always been very anxious for our protection, you could not enjoy the pleasure of having us as your babies, as your growing boys, and as your adolescent youths. Unfortunately, being ordered by fate, we could not be raised by you to enjoy childhood pleasures at home. My dear father and mother, a man has a debt to pay to his parents. According to the Vedas, this human form of life enables one to fulfill one's desires to the fullest. And only in this human form is there every possibility that one can get liberation from material existence. This body is produced by the combined efforts of the father and mother. So every human being should be obliged to his parents. But if a person is able to give protection to the elderly, to the children, the spiritual master, to the Brahmins and other dependents, but does not do so. He is considered to be already dead, although he is supposedly breathing. My dear father and mother, we could not serve you for reasons beyond our control. Please excuse us for our sinful action. When the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna was speaking as an innocent boy in very sweet words, both Vasudeva and Devaki became captivated. They were amazed and could not speak, but simply embraced him and Balarama in great affection and remained silent, shedding incessant tears. Then Krishna approached his grandfather, Ugrasena. My dear King Ugrasena, let all witness that you are again leader of the Bhoja dynasty. You shall also rule the Yadu, Andaka, and Vrishni dynasties. It will be our pleasure to be your servants. Protected by Balaram and myself, you will be honored even by the demigods from the heavenly planets. My dear grandfather, out of fear of Kamsa, all the kings were very anxious and disturbed. They had left their palaces and were living in distant lands. Now you can pacify them and assure them that the whole kingdom will once again live in peace and prosperity. Now, after the death of Kangsa and the reinstatement of King Ugrasena, the kings were given many presents and comforts. They returned to their respective homes and peace was once again brought to the land. The citizens of Mathura were also pleased for they were now protected by the strong arms of Krishna and Balaram. In their presence, the government flourished and the inhabitants of Mathura felt complete satisfaction. Seeing Krishna and Balaram daily, they completely forgot all material miseries and even the old men of Mathura became fully invigorated with youthful energy and strength. As soon as the residents saw Krishna and Balaram walking on the street, very nicely dressed, smiling and looking here and there, the citizens became filled with loving ecstasy. In this way, everyone felt happy in all respects.